Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Nordic Football Podcast. My name is Jonathan Vaduba, and I'm joined as ever by my colleague and good friend, Steve Wiss. We are back for another episode, and you've had your fill of Sweden. I hope you enjoyed the last uh, show, which was our Allsvenskan Sweden preview, season preview. And we are back with Norway, Elita Serien, and I've got a bumper show for you today. Um, we're going to be previewing every single team in the league, giving our predictions, bringing new players to watch, and much more. But first of all, we'll start with our Norwegian expert, Steve Wiss. Steve, how are you getting? Yeah, Jonathan, uh, thanks uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm really excited, you know. This is uh, the first of the main uh, leagues that I cover back in action, so I'm chomping at the bit. And, uh, yeah, I'm really ready for this, you know, 16th of June. Um, you know, I can't believe that we're having to wait this long. It feels like sort of the end of March, start of April again in that respect. You know, I've been looking at the team's training and it's bright sunshine and everything. It just feels so weird, you know, ahead of the first game of football. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, very excited for the start of the uh, Elite Serien. Yeah, I was, we were just saying um, before we started recording, weren't we? It's like sort of the FA Cup final when uh, when these season previews come along. You know, I mean, we, 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 we uh, gear ourselves up for it. Um, these shows are really sort of, you know, you can get your... Get your Get your teeth into them um you know they don't call you meat man for nothing so you know this is a chance for you to sink your teeth into into uh the season preview and i'm really excited about it and looking forward to to this show um of course it's been a long long break as you mentioned you know the season ended over six months ago now uh, what's the landscape looking like in norway at this moment in time you know we're ready for the season to start this week what's the overall landscape looking like in the sort of post-covid world what are the new regulations what are the new changes what's been happening since we you know were together on the last norway related show yes well um we've uh, obviously the initial pre-season was well underway um you know teams had been playing some up to six or seven games i think um in the initial pre-season before the lockdown came very swiftly uh, in norway uh, around i think it was 13th of march and uh, you know unlike sweden there was a strict lockdown measures were put in place and uh, you know, the, the, there's a big difference between the cases uh, in, in the two countries. Um, we've got a, uh, obviously, a great preview show uh, today um, focusing on all the teams, but we've also got an exclusive interview with uh, Orla Sund uh, central defender Jonas Groner uh, coming up uh, about midway through the episode. And uh, we do discuss um, a number of things, including the uh, coronavirus uh, outbreak and then how it's difficult it's been for the players, the challenges that have uh, come in but um, obviously there's going to be challenges for the clubs as a whole as, as well um, you know no uh, fans potentially until maybe September along those lines although I think the the Norwegian authorities are looking at potentially letting a certain number of fans uh, a lower number maybe in the hundreds um, just as a tester at some stage to start that off with but um, yeah look Norway as a country has been pretty well prepared with uh, coronavirus and i think the league um, obviously are pretty well organized with it as well so there's optimism you know the league's going back yeah for sure and of course don't forget we we did have a, an episode that you can listen back to at nordic football on twitter or subscribe to us on itunes spotify wherever you get your podcast acast we had an episode with a uh, youth coach at volarenga jack brazil english coach and he talked to us as well about social distancing in norway and how it's changed uh, the task of coaches. So obviously, if you want to listen back to that, there was plenty in our archives for you to be getting your teeth into. Um, you mentioned there that yeah, it's been slightly uh, contained to a certain extent, and and you know fans and that kind of thing. From a psychological point of view, how do you think it will impact the teams, and even from a financial point of view? You know, are we going to see any outliers this season? Um, whether it's in results or whether it's in um, you know maybe teams doing worse because of their finances or because of their um you know the situation or are we looking at maybe it may, maybe being you know, same same as normal if that makes sense I, I believe that the the best teams are going to thrive during these uh periods uh, jonathan the teams have got the biggest squads the best facilities and stuff like that they're going to be better prepared um you know for, for this sort of thing you know the five substitute rule as well that massively helps the teams with bigger squads um, and stuff like that. So I think for some of the smaller teams, it could be that the gulf um, sort of gets even wider. Um, but obviously there's going to be some surprises here and there as well. I don't think an awful lot is going to change in terms of Norway, really, um, in that regard. You know, the fans, um, 
there's not huge attendances in the in the league anyway. It will. Um, it's more about the psychological side of it rather than that. Financially, of course, they, they, they need the money, but attendances have been on the downer anyway. So um, I don't think in that regard it's going to make a huge difference. Yeah, attendances haven't been been fantastic, um, but budget wise, there has been. You know, I think on the last last year's preseason show, I remember we had a big discussion about how the finances in in the two leagues are kind of changing. Um, a lot of outgoings and that kind of thing, you know, a selling a selling league to a certain extent. We've looked at the um, finances for this, you know, this year, and it's kind of looking fairly similar, isn't it? So, you know, we're going to run through every team shortly with their, their transfer business and their relevant deals. We're going to preview every single team in the league and, you know, who, what business they've been doing and where you think they're going to finish, which we'll start in a second. But, yeah, before we get into that, just to give an overview, there's been 153 departures at present uh, with an income value of 4.8 million total roughly uh, and 121 arrivals to the league with a transfer expenditure of 1.4 million so as you can see money draining out of the league millions going out of it not as much coming in but i guess that gives opportunities for um younger players steve what, what's your perspective on that and um you know the transfer window is still open isn't it in norway so do we expect a lot of business as well before we get into it? Do we expect a lot of business and, and how has how things been impacted um, from that point? Yeah, the transfer window opened on the 10th of June. It's going to close on the 30th of June. I think it's going to open uh, 1st of August again as well. So there's going to be a lot of wheeling and dealing this summer in Norway. I mean, already in this particular window, there's teams that are after replacements for... There's already been quite a few injuries in this um, recent preseason. Uh, bad ones as well. So teams are after replacements there. There's contracts running out at, with certain players at end of June and end of July. Um, there's teams from Europe sniffing around guys. There's a few imminent departures very soon. So I expect it to be a very active period. Um, and there could be plenty of comings and goings, to be honest with you. Um, uh, my friend, it's uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, it's going to be pretty mental uh, and hard to keep on top of it at times, perhaps. And as the song goes, that's just the way it is. Things will never be the same. So let's begin our preseason preview. Uh, we're going to preview every single team. And you're going to give your predictions as we did in the last show, as we do in years past. We're going to predict every position in the table. And we're going to begin at the top of the table, aren't we, Steve? So, um, you know, why don't you take it away for us? You've got, we've got, we're going we're gonna to break it down with the top five, aren't we, first? Uh, well, that's who we're going to discuss, and then we have a special interview. Uh, so let's begin with your top five, and I suppose, do you want to give the spoiler immediately, or where do you want to start with that top five? Well, let's go with the top two, and uh, it's pretty obvious that um, the title, I think, will be won by either Mulder or uh, Rosenborg, and I think nearly 99% of people would say that. Uh, and I'm going with Mulder again, uh, last year's champions. I think they're going to have uh, enough to win the league uh, once more. Um you know, in, in terms of actually on paper, the, the, the difference between the two sides isn't that much. Um, in fact, you could even argue that actually on paper, the Rosenborg squad might be even slightly more balanced and, and, and slightly uh, more quality. But um, it just Mulder have got uh, an awful lot more about them in terms of a, a rounded product. So I'm leaning towards Mulder at this point in time, John. So Mulder it is then, and um, they've been doing some business, and of course... They are the reigning champions, uh, Erling Mo, and four-time title winners now, I think it is. So uh, what is it about Mulder that you like? You know, where, where do we start with them? Um, who they brought in and, and you know, what, what are you liking about them this season? Goals. They're, they're an absolute uh, goal machine. Um, their attacking uh, ability is, is insane, actually. Um, I was doing my season previews for my website, and I, I've given them five stars for strikers, attackers, um, wingers, attacking midfielders, it's crazy. I mean, they've got an unbelievable amount of ability. In Lecky James, they've got the best striker in the league. By the way, we did an interview with him last year on the podcast. You can check back on that. Um, he's the best striker in the league. Uh, I think he'll win the golden boot if he stays fit. Um, you've got Magnus Wolf Eichram, who's probably the best player in the whole league. He's got an insane quality. He'll probably only be on the field for about 65 or 70 minutes every week now because of the new substitute rule. Uh, but the, the damage he does in that period of time is just incredible. Um, but they've got tons of backup options. I mean, Ui Umoy Wanfo, he can play up front or on the left wing. 
you know, Eric Bulland Anderson, Erling Knudsen, they've brought in Ola Bryn Hilton from Starbeck. And these guys would be stars for pretty much any other club in the league. But there's going to be three or four of them just warming the bench, Jonathan. Um, and then from midfield, you've got guys like Eric Hestad, Orsnes, uh, and a couple of others. It's They've got unbelievable strength and quality and depth, uh, sort of midfield and attack. The one question mark probably is in defence, and I'll get to that in a minute. But um, sheer weight of goals is going to—they're going to be able to bulldoze through every single side in the league. Uh, it's as simple as that. Yeah, and they won the league pretty comfortably last season, didn't they? By by fourteen points. Uh, also had the top assist provider. Didn't have the top scorer in the league, but you know, in general, they scored a lot of goals. Of course, seventy-two scored, thirty-one conceded. And only lost four games, so they, you know, they really are uh, the big club of that league at this moment in time. Um, tell us about their manager, uh, Steve. Do you think he'll continue where he sort of left off uh, from last year? Because this is second. This will be a second season in the job, I believe. You know, will he suffer from second second season syndrome, or is he going to continue where he left off with this squad? Well, it's quite interesting that of the top five we're going to talk about, you could actually say that four of the managers there's question marks about really that are they actually that good? Um, Erling Moo is, um, I think he's actually a bit underrated, but I wouldn't say he's anything special. What he is good at doing is man managing the players. He rotated, I mentioned this before, he rotated the, the squad really well last year during the European campaign. That could be important going forward because there will be European matches, hopefully in the autumn, uh, Mulder are going to be in the Champions League qualifiers or whatever. Um, but he's got a big squad to rotate. He's got to keep people happy, but he's proven that he can do that. And, um, you know, their starting 11 is going to be really hard to predict most weeks. But his man management and, uh, of the players is really good. He doesn't, like James said in the interview last year, he doesn't overcomplicate things. I think that's a big strength of a manager. But you do feel like if he was up against a really elite sort of couple of managers, uh, then he may be out, he would be outfoxed a bit. But he doesn't really have that. Um, you know, the other managers up there are not anything special, in my opinion. The, the one problem there from Older is defence. Uh, they've lost Christopher Harold's side, who's a big right back. He's just recently uh, injured his uh, cruciate ligament. He's out for the whole season. So that's a big problem for them there. They're going to have to go with Marcus Holm Holmgren Pedersen, a young uh, right back who's come from Trumsa, and he's going to be quite raw. They've also got a raw left back coming, John Kitalano, on loan from Wolves. He was originally at Odd. But uh, Kitalano, I would expect, will sort of rotate with Christopher Hagen, um, who's the main left back there. Um, but defence is a little bit uh, weak. They also lost Vegar Foran to a sort of off-the-field issue. Where there was a gambling matter there that um, got a bit complicated. Um, so he left the club by a mutual consent, now moved to Brand. So they're a bit lightweight at, lightweight at the back, and some teams will be able to profit on that. But even if you score two goals against them, John, they're probably going to get three or four. So uh, it's not such a big issue. But, yeah, the soft spot is in defence, although Andres Linda, goalkeeper, is quite solid. Now, Norwegian football is generally considered, you know, I'm not going to say tame, but it's generally considered sort of a, quite an amiable, friendly league, I, I think, if you were to ask 100 people. You know, it's not got the reputation of being like a, you know, like a crazy league, has it? But one thing did strike my eye in, in, in pre-season, and that's what I want to ask you about quickly, it's... Uh, Ola Brynildsen. Now, this move to Mulder really has caused quite a stir, hasn't it, Steve? I mean, I just want to sort of um, uh, highlight the fact that a banner was hung outside his house when he went to Mulder with a, a sign saying, here was born a Judas outside the house of his mother uh, the night before the transfer was announced, I, I understand. And it's caused quite some considerable um, discord, hasn't it, in, in Norwegian football in general. What, what's the deal with this uh, Ola Brynildsen move, uh, Steve? And, and tell us about him. I mean, what's What's the beef there with with that Molder move? You know, is there is there some background story to it that we don't know about, or and what kind of player is he, and what will he do at Mold? He's a very talented winger from Starbeck. Uh, did really well. Well, uh, he can pretty much play anywhere in attack, really, if you want him to. Um, so yeah, a young talented player there. That uh, I think Starbeck were always going to have to sell him at some point, but uh, it's just that I think they weren't happy with the way Molder conducted the business. Molder themselves are not a very well well not a very well liked club. At the moment in Norway in general because of their links with uh, uh, past stuff regarding uh, one of their former players um, which I don't really want to go into here but um, the, the, the general gist of it is that um, they're not very well liked across the country so any sort of small thing um, with them there that people are going to latch on to so 
it look it's a bit of fist, it's a bit of handbags in a way uh, i would say um but it's just one of them cases of a big club basically snatching a good young talent away right under the eyes of a sort of a smaller one really that's just got a bit arsy with it and what kind of player is he i mean what can they expect well, you know you mentioned there's going to be some rotation this season from from Mulder. you know will he be a prominent player or will he be more of a you know player he'll be more on the bench i think um but he'll get minutes you know as i say the, the, the guys on the bench like Bryn Hildson or anderson or so um Knudsen. I mean, those guys, that would be an incredible trio starting for anyone else, uh, you know, certainly outside the top three. But they're going to be on the bench here at Mulder. That is how strong they are. It's, they've got insane depth in midfield and attack. It's, it's outrageous, actually. But yeah, Bryn Hilson, fast uh, winger, good, skillful player, a bit lightweight, uh, lacks a little bit of strength at times, but very skillful and agile on the ball. And I just think I say, first place for me is my prediction. I think Rosenberg will be closer to them this year. We'll talk about them in a minute. But um, the sheer weight of goals, you know, they can outscore absolutely anyone on the day. So there we go. First place, Mulder. That's the prediction. And um, love to hear your thoughts on it. So let us know, you know, leave us a comment when this podcast is out and tell us your thoughts if you agree or disagree. Now, second place last season was a team that wasn't expected at all, was it? Wasn't it, Steve? I mean, who can remember that fantastic season? We'll talk about them later. Buda Glimp, they, they were 14 points behind Mulder, but... Rosenborg were not even in second place last year. You know, they're a further two points back from Buda Glimp and 16 points behind Mulder. I mean, you, you've got them in second place this season. So you think they're going to slightly improve? Um, do you think it'll be enough to close that 16-point gap? Do you think they're going to mount a title challenge? Or do you think, you know, uh, yeah, if we do move on to Rosenborg now, what's what's the outlook for them? Yeah, they simply have to be in with a, a title challenge if you look at the squad they've got on paper. But remember your preview um, in Sweden regarding Malmö and you had a doubt over the manager? It's exactly my problem here in the Eilic Horniland. I was not particularly impressed with him last year, as regular listeners of the podcast will, will, uh, will remember. I was regularly criticising him. And, um, you know, he managed to get them in third place just, although Odd pretty much choked. Um, and I think he was a little bit lucky to keep his job, although you could argue, you know, he got him third in the end, give him another chance, but... I just don't feel like he's the right fit at Rosenborg. It just never has felt right from day one, you know, um, his system here. He's basically been forced to play a 4-3-3 because that's how Rosenborg play. They play 4-3-3. But that isn't his natural way. He's more of a 4-2-3, one sort of man, you know. Um, so he's kind of had to adapt himself here a bit. But, I mean, he's got unbelievable talent on paper, uh, which I'll, I'll go into. But... Um, yeah, Adi Cornland is my big concern with the manager. I'm not sure some of the players necessarily are there for him. Are they really playing for him? He's upset certain guys in the past. A couple of them lads have now gone, which helps. But um, I do always sometimes wonder, does he have the dressing room here? So um, we'll talk about players in a minute, but manager-wise, and that's a big thing, isn't it, manager? You, that is why I just don't think they're going to have enough. I don't think he'll get the best out of the players throughout the whole season. Yeah, hundred percent. And I remember you—you you were not a fan of him last year, really, were you? Um, I think you've made made that um, clear many a time on, on your doubts about him potentially. And to be as to be fair to you, you were right last season. I mean, they only won one of their first eight games uh, last year, and it did sort of go a little bit pear shaped. Um, what's what is there to suggest that they'll have improved this this summer? Oh, sorry, this you know this well, it's been half a year, isn't it? So you could say winter or summer. But um, what's been there to suggest that they're going to make improvements? Uh, this season, you know, what's what's new about the club? What can we look for? Well, the squad is high quality anyway, but let's just talk on the wings. I think they're two top players out in, in attack. It's definitely Samuel Adig Benro and Paul Endre Helland. Now, unfortunately, both are incredibly injury prone and uh, just cannot seem to stay fit at all. But at the moment, they are on the field and they're doing pretty well. And they've looked good in pre season, especially uh, Paul Endre Helland has apparently got the real bit between his teeth. And look, if he's on form and he's up for it, there's very few better players in the whole division. So if you can get Samuel and, and Paul-Andre Helland firing, that's big. They've got Dino Islamovic has come in from Ostersund. We've talked about him before. I'm not sure he's the answer for Rosenborg, but he's probably a better fit for the the manager's system. And he's going to get a supply line. Uh, that's for sure in the middle. So there's plenty of goals uh, potentially there. Um, they've got a guy coming in August from Hertha Berlin called Per Silian Shellbred. Have you ever heard of him? 
Um, and look, I watched him the other day in the Bundesliga, actually. I mean, he's going to go from Germany's top division to this. I mean, come on, it's going to be a piece of cake for him, isn't it? I mean, he's going to actually cruise this league. So that's great depth there. They brought Christopher Zachariasen from Sarsborg, who's a top player, really good midfielder. So they've signed well. And there's even rumours that they might even get someone like Turgi Bourbon um, before the end of this window. So, look, they're, they're a big club. They've got big clout. They've, they've supported the manager in the transfer window in the market pretty well. They got rid of Soderlund, Mars Johnson, Mike Jensen, who weren't really behind the manager, I don't think. Um, and they've got loads of quality. Let me just start here. In goal, they've got Andre Hansen, who's the best goalkeeper in the league. Julian Firelund is going to warm the bench. Now, Firelund would probably start for about 12 teams in this league. That's how good he is. So, unbelievable goalkeeping options. They've got a good experience in defence. I think defence is a little bit moulder. Bit of a weak spot potentially. Berger Melling is going to get sold very, very soon, I think, to a French club. Possibly Nîmes, I think, are in for him. So that he's going to try and train Anders Tronson, who's a D mid. He's going to trade the manager's going to train him to him into a left back. Another reason I just don't like I don't see the logic behind that. Tronson is a quality defensive midfielder. So why retrain him as a left back? The manager is weird here for me. I just don't agree with some of his decisions. Um, but they got, you know, the old dog, Torre Reginiusen's quality uh, guys in the middle of the park, like Conradson. Look, the quality's there, Jonathan. Um, even the players, if the players want to win the title, they can almost police themselves, forget the manager. Um, they've got to definitely get closer to, to Mulder this, this year, I think. Um, but I don't believe they'll have enough. Now, Rosenborg only, I find this quite surprising, only won back-to-back -back games three times last season. Um, consistency seems a major issue there. What what has the manager done to you know bring about more consistency? Um, has there been any tactical changes that you've seen, or, or what? How do you expect them to line up this season in terms of formation wise? Uh, and why are they so in inconsistent last year? Is it, is it just a manager thing, like you said, or have they rectified that? Let's see if you can guess how many away wins they had in the league out of uh, fifteen. I wouldn't like to guess. I mean, I guess three or four. Three, yeah, and that's basically the problem. They couldn't win away from home, and there's a few reasons for that. He they can't break down resolute sides, his system isn't fluid enough. Um, and the other problem, I think, and this might be an issue, uh, Holland does not like to rotate his side much at all. And I think this is the year you're going to have to do that. Um, and I think he just kind of overburnt some of the players, um, leading to like one good performance in midweek, say in Europe, and then they come back in the league and it was just flat and, sh and shite. Um, and then that could be an issue again this year. We might see them go up and down. He's got the depth here if he wants to bring a few youngsters in. I mean, but whether or not he gives them enough game time, I'm not sure. Um, again, it all comes down to the manager. He needs to show this year that he can adapt and uh, be more fluid and, uh, you know, rotate and keep things fresh a bit, really. And, and you're right, get more consistency. But I've, in my mind, there's still question marks. Until we see it out there, I'm not sure. And just finally on that, um, does that mean that, you know, you're saying is they're, they're so bad away from home? Do you think part of that was because of fans and the fact that they're playing against, you know, they're the big team of Norway, aren't they? They're playing against probably fans who really want to beat them. Do you see that being impacted now with, with no fans being in the stadium? Does that you know yeah. I think certain teams, when they, when they were facing Rosenborg at home last year, in the past they wouldn't have fancied it at all. But suddenly they're like, you know what, bring them on. They seem quite vulnerable at the minute. We can take them on. And um, to be fair, their away record should improve, uh, really, because, yeah, when they go away from home, they take a lot of fans themselves. But the atmosphere is a full house and everyone's behind whoever they're, uh, you know, the opposition. So they probably will improve away from home by default in that regard. But the biggest issue is that they come up against some good defensive sides who are resolute and hard to break down. I'm just never convinced. Uh, you're relying on individual quality like Samuel and Paul Andre Helen to sort of uh, cut something loose there. Um, but uh, whether or not they can even stay fit is a big question mark. So um, in my mind, I think they'll, they'll get closer to Mulder. I think probably could get within five points of them. And, you know, with a bit of luck, it can go either way, can't it? Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the top two will be quite well clear, in my opinion. OK, you got them in second place, so that's interesting. And in third place, you've gone for a new team, one of the teams who wasn't in the top three last season, and that is, uh, well, take it away, Steve. Tell us who you've got in third place. Well, this might be a little bit optimistic, but I've gone with uh, Vorlerenga in third. And um, the, this is the big manager change of the uh, off-season. Uh, Dog uh, Lev Fergamo's move from odd 
after 12 years, 12 years at odd, he's gone to the capital and uh, so it's about time someone took this club challenging for medals. Ronnie Dyler couldn't do it, but look, for Germer's an old dog, um, experienced figure. We could come down to managers and he has his own failings as well. He was getting a bit stale, perhaps odd himself, but do you know, I think if you put uh, for Germer in charge of Rosenberg, they'd win the, they'd, they'd win the league probably. Um, because he, he knows what he's doing. He's got, he's, he's going to bring his four, three, three system into Volarenga. And there's not been many changes here. He's only signed one player, and that's Frederick Aldrup Jensen, who he had at odd for quite a lot of years. A really good defensive midfielder. Um, it was key to that key to his system in that four three three is that defensive midfielder is a bit deeper. Um, that is a big role in his uh, for Germo's system. But just one new signing really of significance. Uh, but the rest of the squad, um, I've said before, the quality is there on paper, but it just wasn't happening uh, for Ronnie Dyler. They've got it, um, especially certainly. In attack, they've got loads of ability. Um, I just think the change of manager is going to be a big thing here. Yeah, and if you look at you know them from last season, you mentioned Odd finished fourth, so uh, and level on points in Rosenborg, in fact. So maybe you know, are you is your assumption there that with a better, maybe a better? I mean, do they have a better squad than Odd, in your opinion? Yeah, they um, do. Yeah. yeah, I would say they do have a better squad than Odd, and of course, it's going to probably take him maybe two or three years to make this team his own. But, you know, it's interesting that he hasn't really got rid of too many players either. That me means he must be quite happy with what, with what he's got there. And already the, the vibes have been really good from training. Look, he's a disciplinarian. And that's what this team needed. They had a soft underbelly, mentally a bit weak. He's he's, he's going to instill a lot more discipline. Um, he's not going to, you know, tolerate any slackers in there. He's going to get the most out of his squad. And, you know, I think his system, the 4-3-3, two wingers, you know, sometimes it can be fluid with the sort of uh, one of them an inside forward. He's got that. And Aaron Dunham on the right-hand side is a really top talent. Um, Board Finner, he's going to, one of these years, have a really consistent season and just deliver a fantastic statistics. Matches Willy Armson up front. Now, Willy Armson was used as a number 10 by Dyla last year, which was stupid. Why would he use it like sort of a complete forward target man figure? As a, as a number 10, it just wasn't, was never going to work. He's going to be the, leading the line on his own. And I bet he gets sort of 10 to 15 goals, Willie Armson, with the service here. I think probably the one question mark is that midfield. Jensen is, is a big um, positive addition. Maybe they could do with another sort of really controlling midfielder. But the, in defence, they've got enough. They've got a really good young keeper to look out for. Christopher uh, Clarsen, 19-year-old keeper, really strong uh, talent. We'll talk about him later. Um, but they've got good defenders like Sam Adekuk Bay is an example. But a good, ba really good balanced squad, new manager, new system. Um, I think they'll be third, fourth or fifth. It's just a question of how high. You know, for Germo's experience, maybe we'll get him over the line for the bronze medal. Yeah, optimistic. Um, positioning there for, for Wallerengo. And in fourth place, uh, who have you gone for? I'm going with Bran in fourth. And um, I was looking at this squad just uh, the other night. And, um, you know, on paper... There's enough there to actually launch a title challenge in the right hands. Again, the big problem here is the manager. is is a, is a huge problem. Lajan and Nielsen is not the man for me to lead Brand. They need a change. He was very lucky to keep his job, in my opinion, ninth place last year. He's too negative. He's too boring. You know, there was a period last year where Brand could hardly score a goal. I mean, which is unheard of, isn't it, in Norwegian football for a team like them? He obviously has his positive sides. Who can forget? 2018, how strong they were defensively for a long time until Brat Harland killed them. Um, but I mean, they've got a great lineup of defenders, Bran. They've got quality all over the field. But the issue is, is, is this uh, is the coach going to get the most out of it? I don't think so. But when you actually look at the players on the, you know, in the starting 11 in the squad itself, you know, I think with a more sort of a positive, younger, fresher approach, they would, even, they would be an outsider for the title. But there'll be too many times that they just don't break down sides. But um, we'll talk about some of the players in a minute. But my main issue again is the manager here. Yeah, now an interesting thing with Bran is they were the, they were the subject of both the biggest defeat away from home and the biggest defeat at home last season. Joint uh, losing five one at home to Viking, and also losing uh, six nil at Strums Godset. So. I mean, when I ever think, whenever I think of Brand, I think of quite a big club, to be honest. And and you know, they, they tend to have a well in the past quite good attendances and that kind of thing. Um, given that they finished so low last season, and you've got them, you know, a bit higher this season, what, what is the actual overall expectations for Brand uh, at this moment in time? 
And you're right, they are a big club. They're well supported. Um, they might be one of the teams that sort of lose out with home advantage. They get a lot of fans coming, and I think it's a big part of their game and when the fans are behind them anyway. Uh, expectations are always quite high. I'm sure there'll be a number of fans actually hoping they could even launch a title bid. And like I said, looking on paper, they've got the quality. So I don't see why fans shouldn't be sort of dreaming of that or, or, or hoping for that, certainly. And the media predictions will be all over the, 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 the shop, really. Some will predict them high, some will predict them low. Um, I mean, ninth last year should never have been that low. Um, but let's just go through the squad. We have to start in goalkeeper, where officially they've actually got five guys on the books at this point in time. They were, they were going to get Ralph Farman on, on, uh, from Schalke on loan, but that, that was going to end 30th of June, so that's out of the way. They've got a couple of keepers who are not good enough, really, Hakan Opdal and Ira Johansson. So they signed Ali Ahmada, you may remember him, um, an ex-Toulouse uh, legend, who we'll have to talk about... <laughs> Uh, for sure. He scored a goal for Toulouse, a famous goal back in the past. So he's been at Congvinia the last year or two. Um, very eccentric goalkeeper. Um, you can, he's, he could be anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so he probably start. But legend. An absolute legend, Ali Ahmada. I mean, goalkeeper will be, I could just see it being like, they could use like three keepers throughout the season, knowing Bran. But um, the good news for, the, for that is that the defence looks five star. They've signed Vegar Foran from Mulder, who's top player at this level. Bismarck Acosta, Ruben Christiansen, Tayo Tanisa. It's a bit old, that defence, but very experienced, hard to break down. They've got some good younger players chomping at the bits for minutes as well. That is a five-star defence, I tell you. Hard to penetrate. Uh, might, probably the best defence in the league, actually. Um, and the defensive midfield, they're well-loaded as well. Lights of uh, Armour or, or, or Dagic, Christopher Barman. Um so in really resolute side in that regard, you, you know, physical beasts uh, there, even though they've lost Vito Wormgall, which is a big blow, they've done well to, to replace him. Um, and then in, in midfield and attack, they've got they've got quality like Dauda Bamba, Robert Taylor, Gilbert Coombson uh, and Petter Strand and, uh, and, and, and Frederick Holgan. It's just the problem is the manager doesn't play attacking enough to get the most out of it. I mean, Coombson and Bamba last year both publicly said they were really frustrated with the system. Whether or not the coach is going to listen, I hope he has. Surely he has. Because you mentioned the big defeats last year. They were quite close to each other. Now, if you lose 5-1 at home and 6-0 away, what does that suggest to you that you've lost the dressing room? And I was sure he was going to get fired. So he's he's obviously done something to convince the board. And um, he's got. To, I hope he changes something, but I just don't see it. But they've got enough quality just by default to be in the top five, you know. Why is it then? You know, you, you're before we move on to the next uh, team, you, you've um, you've sort of called out two managers there. Is there is there an issue with management in in Elite Seven? Is there maybe a dearth of top managers, or um, is it just uh, two cases there? I mean, Brand, uh, just for the record, they won ten, lost ten, and drew ten last season, so very consistent from that point of view. But um, you know, yeah, is, is that you know, is there a dearth of top managers in Elite Seven? Maybe, or are they are the big clubs just not choosing the right the right managers in the past? Well, Arjan and Nielsen has been at the club for five years and he's led them to a promotion. And of course, in 2018, they perhaps couldn't, couldn't, should have won the league. I'm not, I'm not saying he's a bad manager. It just feels sometimes that it, everywhere, anywhere across the world, sometimes you've just got to move on, haven't you? Have a fresh change of approach. And that's what's needed at Brand. They need just a new guy to take over the reins. A bit like Volarenga with Dyler. I said he needed to move on and, you know, there's a change there. That's what Brand needed. They need sort of a younger fresher, more attack-minded coach. That's In my opinion, I'm not saying Lazard and Nielsen's bad. And you look at Rosenborg, you, you suppose you should give them credit for bringing in Eric Hornerland from Holgerson. You know, they've, they've took a manager who's done well at another club. But I just don't think the club, these bigger clubs are looking at the the right fit. They need to choose a manager that's going to suit that club, club ethos, that's going to suit the players actually currently within the squad. That's where they're making the mistakes at the minute. You know, and Mulder... You know, the minute uh, Erling Moo is probably the best of a poorer bunch up there, um, really. But um, who knows? You know, maybe they've done the, because of his good man management skills, it's um, it's obviously working out so far. But yeah, there's a lack of really, really quality managers in those uh, top four. Okay, and we've got fifth place now, and you've got Viking, um, who you know they've only been promoted a, a year or so ago, so that's um, quite a big. But cool there, isn't it? Steve, or is that, is, you know, is that what's the reason for this optimism with Viking? 
but I'm actually going to lay off the manager here. This is an example where the manager is really highly thought of and, and a lot of people are saying he gets the most out of the players. Bjarne Bernsen's done a great job at Viking, got them promoted uh, 2018 and then finished fifth last year in the league, plus a cup win. Uh, fantastic stuff for, for Viking, a big club historically, um, and maybe they're back in business. But um, I just see them sort of... Uh, I mean, they're going to be in Europe eventually, uh, which uh, could be a problem. Historically, sides that you know have to travel for these qualifiers do struggle, so that might take a bit out of them. They've lost key players in Zlatko Tripic, Benjamin Kalman, Christian Torsvet has gone. Um, so um, they've lost some players there. They've gained Jan de Lanley, who's injury-prone, but fucking uh, absolute quality uh, on his day uh, wide. Veton Barish has come from Brand, which is a bit of an interesting transfer as the two clubs hate each other. But he used to be at Viking, so he's kind of come home. Um, and they're, they're well coached. They, they do rotate really well. They did that last year. Uh, seem a really together unit. They've got some exciting young players like Adrian Nielsen Pereira at left back. Uh, Sandra Bierschall as well. It's really good. Um, and uh, yeah, a well rounded unit, uh, Jonathan, uh, who uh, every reason that they could be in the top five. I've seen some people predict them as high as third, and that, that could happen as well. They're not good enough to launch a title bid. But um, just a really good uh, unit all round, you know. But see, a club that's in a much, much better place than it was two or three, uh, three, three years ago. Yeah, and of course, cup wins can always spur teams on as well, can't they? And, and you know, like you said, they did have a good season, uh, a good season last year. Um, how active have they been in the market from that, you know, in t- from that point of view? Um, and is there any players that they might lose now with the, the, with the window coming? I mean, to have such a good season after promotion you'd expect they might lose some. Is there any more that might leave on the horizon? or are they, uh, How are they looking? I don't think they're going to lose many others. Um, I think most of the damage was done earlier on in the winter. Um, so they've had time to prepare for that. And you know, they've been active. There's been plenty of ins and outs. Um, in goalkeeper, I've mentioned Ivan Uspo before. Um, the goalkeeper's going to be a real problem. They've signed someone called Aril, Aril Ospo. So they've got, literally got two Ospos, but they're spelt differently and pronounced very very similar um at um so, so we've got um to, but he, ospo coming in uh, is a really good uh, backup and he's going to sort of compete with uh, the current number one so they sorted that problem out the defense pretty much stays the same which is uh, a positive and then midfield they've brought a guy called joe bell in uh, who i don't know an awful lot about that christopher luckberg um, and they replaced those guys that they sold um, with uh, the landlady and Barisha, like I said. So like for like, they've done their business really well. And, um, you know, I think Viking are a club on the up and um, they're going to do, they rotate the squad really well. So they're going to keep players fresh. Fantastic stuff. And yes, funnily enough, you mentioned uh, they might not lose any more players. And uh, well, we've we've got a player now, haven't we, uh, coming up? Um, that's going to talk. talk uh, yeah. Yeah, we've got um, an exclusive interview with uh, Orlesund uh, centre-back uh, Jonas Groner. So uh, I'm going to uh, take you away with that interview right now. But uh, join us after the break where we're going to talk about uh, the rest of the league uh, along with my 10 players to watch. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to get stuck into this interview, which is about 20 minutes long, and then uh, we'll come back for the second half of the podcast. Yeah, and just to, just to reiterate there, so um, you've got Viking fifth, Brown in fourth, Ballerenga third, Rosenborg second and Mulder first. So uh, join us after this interview. And on this edition of the Nordic Football Podcast, we are delighted to be joined by Orlesund uh, central defender Jonas Gruner. Um, welcome to the uh, show, Jonas. Thanks very much for coming on. How are you? Thank you. I'm, I'm good. I'm uh, excited to be here. And uh, this is uh, new for me doing a podcast in English. So bear with me. That's fantastic that uh, we've got you uh, on this uh, episode of the Nordic Football Podcast. And I think the first place that I'm going to have to uh, start with and talk about is how is Norway in general at the moment with, um, you know, after the coronavirus outbreak? I know your country um, was very, very good um, about shutting things down early. Um, how are things recovering now? Is life kind of getting back to normal there? Yeah, it's getting back slowly. Um but uh, as you said, we, we um, closed down the country early. Uh, it has and it will have massive consequences in um, 
uh, for a long, long time. But uh, things are starting to get back to normal, and uh, uh, actually, our, us football players are the ones who are one of the groups that's most affected at the moment because we're still in quarantine to to be able to play football. But uh, the rest of the country is slowly opening up, and uh, it looks uh, better and better for the for the uh, for the country. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah. we have we've, we've been lucky. That's good to hear that it's looking better and better for for Norway. And um, I would say for the listeners who aren't aware, um, the Norwegian season usually starts around the first week of April. And basically all of the clubs have done the majority of pre-season. It got to about, I think, the 15th of March, around that date. And then suddenly you have to shut off completely. I mean, how difficult was that? Because you're, you're getting ready for the new season and suddenly you're shutting off completely. It must have been really hard. Uh, we actually we came uh, the 12th of March. We came uh, back home from Spain from a 12-week pre camp in in Marbella. And when we uh, boarded the flight in in Spain, everything was pretty normal in Norway. And f- uh, four hours later, when we landed, everything was shut down. So when we landed, we were in quarantine. We didn't know anything. We just kn- knew that we had to get home. There would be no football for a while. And um, it was just uh, we were entering last phase of the of the preseason, and then suddenly we had to uh, start. Uh, I was we were, was almost not allowed to leave the house, so we just had to run outside and couldn't play football, couldn't touch the ball. So we just had to restart, and uh, and uh, we didn't know the that was the the worst thing about it that we didn't know anything and how long it would be. But uh, they opened up pretty quickly for training in groups uh, because we had. To, the authorities had control and uh, and we've been training with football since like beginning of April and uh, with contact for a few weeks now so we're getting closer and closer but it's been the longest preseason of uh, of our lives uh, at yeah. least yeah a- absolutely crazy and um, I mean we're doing this interview on uh, Sunday the 7th of, of June now in nine days time uh, roundabout now you will be on the field <clears throat> hopefully and on the field anyway against uh, Molder in the first elite of Serian match and um, how do you personally feel physically how do you think the rest of the Orlesum squad is is coping um, and how sharp are you you know uh, have you been given enough time do you think to get back um, to, to proper fitness before the start of the season enough time that's a that's a good question because we, we, we're given the time we're given and we just have to take that because uh, there is no choice, uh, really. We should have more time. We should have more time to play football. We should have more time to play training games so we uh, can adapt our bodies to to uh, game mode. We actually played our first uh, friendly game yesterday uh, in three months. Um, when you play, uh, you can train as much as you want, but you, the only way to, to get the, the match feeling and the match fitness is by playing games. So we just have to use the first uh, games of the season to to get the match fitness going and everybody has been training like uh, crazy for, for the time in quarantine mm-hmm. so the fitness level is okay but the match fitness and the football fitness is what's required now and that's the only way to improve that is by playing games and we, we only have this one game yesterday so now, now it's starting either we like it or not so we just have to be ready that's, uh, that's the thing Obviously, one of the big things about football returning across the whole of the world and, and Europe is that the games are going to be played behind closed doors with no uh, fans. Um, now, how much of a big impact do you think that will have in Norway? Because, you know, you don't get as many big attendances, perhaps in Norway. Um, do you think it will make a big impact? Will home advantage be lost a lot or not? I think the, I think we will we will definitely notice and, and have, feel a difference because the the whole feeling around it is going to be like a training game when we when we enter the pitch and there's nobody there even though the not many stadiums in Norway that's full uh, so we're still going to notice but hopefully we uh, we will find some solutions where we can uh, eventually get some. Uh, audience in and uh, have a little bit of uh, uh, people and fans in the stands uh, so the match feeling would be the same but uh, uh, it's equal for everybody so we just have to take what it is and uh, and get used to it so uh, yeah it's going to be strange OK well let's just talk a little bit about uh, Olesen then and um, for those who don't know uh, your team were absolutely brilliant in 2019 in the Obos Ligain you won 25 out of 30 games, just one defeat. Uh, you absolutely smashed 
that league, uh, Jonas. And um, I think it's fair to say you were absolutely deserved champion. So, um, what's it been like since you've moved to Orlesund? Because that seems like a very great team you, you've got there. Yeah, last year was fantastic. Yeah. Every football player wants to play football and, and every football player wants to play, uh, win football games. And that's why I came to Orlesund because I, I, I needed to restart a little bit and, and play football. And uh, I came to a team that... We won 15 out of 15 home games and we, like you said, we won almost every game we played. So it was just a fantastic season um, with winning games and uh, hopefully we will get that uh, killer instinct and winner instinct and bringing that into the lead series this year. And we know that we have a good team with a solid system. We just have to yeah. we just have to work hard and uh, people are going to struggle with us, with us this year, hopefully. Yeah, you mentioned the system there, and um, I guess two questions here. Um, what is it like working under Lars uh, Behinen? And, uh, I mean, the system there is sort of a 4 3 4 3 or a 3 1 um, system with two sort of strikers sometimes. It's, it's quite technical, isn't it? And uh, what, what's it like um, playing in that sort of formation? First of all, when I came up here, I knew uh, what kind of coach he was and uh, what kind of system he was playing, but I had no idea how complex it was and how how difficult it would be and how uh, uh, much of a difference it is playing with three at the back for our centre backs. Because um, I've played uh, in uh, two uh, centre back system my whole life, and suddenly I came here uh, playing with three, and I thought it would be maybe easier to be a centre back, but. It's it's so different, and even though I played in all three roles at the back, and everyone is different from uh, from each other. Like if you play in the middle, you have these um, these roles, and if you play to the left or right, you have different um, tasks. So uh, Lars is very clear about his system and how he wants to do things, and that's really good because that uh, makes everything easier for for the players. But um, it's a different difficult system, and, and as he says, when three five two or three four three is working, it's one of the best system. But when when you're struggling, then then you're absolutely fucked in this in this system yeah. because it's 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 uh, it's um, vulnerable. But when you do it good, you, it's really really good. Do you think it's a formation which can take some time for players to learn if they're not used to it? Yeah, hundred yeah. uh, percent. As I said, when I came up, I came in the middle of the season and. Uh, I'd had two weeks uh, to to learn the system before I started playing games, and I had, uh, I'm still learning now two years later. So uh, it's a very different system, but uh, it's a very fun system to play, and um, and there are not many teams in Norway playing like this. So now, just in preseason, a lot of the big teams wanted to play us because we were one of the teams uh, that played differently in in this league and in this country. So um, uh, that's a big. Uh, advantage for us that uh, nobody plays yeah. like us so we may, might have an advantage there if we, if we can make it work now uh, we obviously have quite a lot of um, English uh, listeners on this podcast and um, a lot will be uh, interested that you've actually signed Jordan Much there at Orlesund, um for this season um, what have you made of him so far in training do you think he's going to be a big asset to the club yeah he's a he's a both a great guy uh, off the pitch but uh, on the pitch you can see he's been on a different level uh, he can do things that uh, nobody else can and uh, he came here training for a few days and already there then he hadn't been training or playing games in a long time but he came here and he just uh, you, you just could see that he was something different and he could do stuff that you you don't see in Norway so um, if he gets uh, a lot of games and can keep uh, his body fit uh, then he will he will absolutely smash this league for sure. Yeah, I definitely think you've got a lot of uh, very interesting players here at Aulis and um, we, we tend to get a lot of listener questions about Elite Serian Fantasy, Jonas. Um, so I just w would like to get your opinions on a couple of players at your club. Um, first of all, yourself. You seem quite cheaply priced at 4.5 million. Um, you think you can get uh, maybe a few clean sheets or maybe even pop up with uh, a few goals from corners maybe? Hopefully, uh, clean sheets is uh, always a target for us, uh, our centre backs, and, uh, and we had uh, a very solid defensive structure structure last year, and uh, that's going to be the key if we're going to survive and, and do well this year. So that's um, 
uh, going to be really important. And uh, uh, I have been uh, dangerous uh, in uh, scoring goals uh, earlier, but uh, no goals last year. But I had a few assists, so uh, yeah. playing to the right in a, in our system, uh, which probably is going to be my role. I uh, I get really offensive, so hopefully I will contribute with some yeah. assist and maybe a few goals. Probably the most talked about player. Uh, in the whole game, actually, is Nicolas Castro. Um, and, um, I mean, he looks a fantastic talent. Um, uh, he, some amazing numbers, um, statistical numbers of goals, assists last season. Just how good is Nicolas Castro, do you think, Jonas? And um, how far can he go in the game of football? Oh, he's an uh, uh, point uh, player, and uh, he's, he's just... Uh something uh, when when we're struggling you know that he's gonna pop up and do things that uh, nobody else can and, and win us games so uh, we're uh, depending on him on him to uh, to uh, to win games actually because uh, he scores goals he creates chances he has assists he can do everything offensively and he, he, he also works really really hard so um, he runs the most. He tackles the most. He uh, scores the most. So yeah, he's a he's a very very good player. Yeah, I mean you've got uh, a new player in Seaman Nordley as well uh, that's come to the club. Another very exciting talent. You've got um, the likes of uh, Fred Johnson up front, and 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 uh, Sigurd Horgan has uh, just come uh, to the team. You've got quite a lot of depth here at Allersund, and and do you think that's going to be important? this year because you're going to have matches sort of maybe Saturday, Wednesday could you see quite a lot of rotation in general across the league uh, it, uh, it has to be a lot of rotation this year because um, one thing is that the games are coming close but the second thing is that we've, our bodies hasn't had time to prepare probably for uh, for football like we've we just had a contact training for a few weeks, and you can you can train as much as you want. But the only way to to have that fitness, as I was saying earlier, is to to play games and to uh, to uh, uh, yeah, yeah to get into a to a good uh, game rhythm. So um, if uh, a lot of players play thirty games this season, I will be uh, really surprised. Yeah, I think that would be a real surprise. It's. Um... It could be a year, maybe even where injuries are a problem. Um, but um, let's just move on to... Let's t- 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 talk to us a little bit about the city of Ålesund itself. Uh, for those who don't know much about it, it is on the west coast of Norway there. Always looks very, very beautiful in any of the, the, the TV or, or pictures that I see of the city, Jonas. Um, how have you found uh, living there? It's a, it's a great city. Uh, the only bad thing here is the weather because it's uh, windy and rainy but uh, when the sun is out uh, there is no no better place uh, the mountains around the city is spectacular and with the with the uh, ocean coming into the city as well it's, it's just uh, it's really really nice so if you haven't seen this city you should google it and come visit us because it's uh, it's a great city and a great place to come and see a game as well so if anybody in the England would England wants to see a, a good game and also a good city, then you should come to Olsen for sure. Um, the football club itself is um, obviously it spent the last two seasons in, in the Obostle again, although you know this century it's mostly been in, in the Elite Serie, in the top league of Norway and um, what do you see as the sort of the long term um, ambitions of Olsen that I'm guessing you kind of want to become an established Elite Serie inside that, that kind of wants to challenge towards the top half eventually? Yeah, that's that's our goal, and that's what we're working hard for every day. And um, uh, yeah, this is a yeah. team, and this is a, a city that deserves a team uh, up there. Uh, and uh, with the, the fans we have here, and uh, this the position the the team and the and the club has in the in the city, then yeah, we need to work really really hard to to uh, make the fans. Uh, uh, happy because uh, you're a very well supported team uh, in Olsen. Um, yeah, and I mean, I don't know. Do you think there will be any fans returning potentially to stadiums this year or not? It doesn't look likely, does it? Actually, there's been talks now uh, that uh, maybe we can make some zones or something on the stands because 
uh, in Norway now we can uh, the rules are that you you can have 200 people in the same area uh, with certain uh, restrictions so um, uh, the hope is that uh, you can somehow uh, make an arrangement where you can have uh, zones in the stands and you can bring in uh, uh, some people and I, I see that uh, as a possibility and I think it will be possible during the season uh, not for the first couple of games but uh, hope for, uh, hopefully not uh, in uh, a distant future Are there any particular matches that you, you yourself are, are really looking forward to and excited about playing against this year maybe some of the bigger clubs or maybe some of the local rivalries like Christiansen? Yeah, we start off with a bang uh, against Molde uh, and uh, we had a great experience against them in the last year in the cup when we beat them 4-0 and uh, they they coming as uh, as the champions uh, of Norway from last year uh, it's going to be a big test but uh, it's going to be a fun game and uh, it's the this should have fans in the stands because that's uh, a, a, a game that's uh, sold out and of course uh, my uh, my former club one is going to be uh, it's going to be special to come back to Norway, you know, come back to Bergen and play against Bonn in the, I think it's the 26th round or something. And that's going to be uh, really really fun. And we play on the, the third game of the season as well as well at home. So that's uh, that was the first game I was looking for when when the season yeah. came out. You, I think you played uh, over over 60 games for Brand. I'm sure you've um, got some great memories there. And uh, I mean, how do you see? Um, some of the bigger clubs doing this season. Who do you think will win the the gold medal in the Elite Serien? I think it's close between uh, Molde and Rosenborg, uh, but I think yeah, that uh, Rosenborg will win it this year. Uh, they have a strong team, and they have uh, uh, they didn't win it last year. So I think um, I think they will be back as champions this year. They, they were struggling with a new coach um, uh, last year, and they will. Uh, he has set his. Um, his ways uh, better this year, so I think they will they will uh, come back and win it this year. Well, we're wishing you all the best at uh, Olsen this year for the whole team and, and yourself personally. Um, you're quite confident about um, sort of not just just avoiding uh, relegation, but really being competitive in the league this season. Yeah, as I said, uh, we have this uh, winning instinct from last year. We are used to winning games, and uh, we used to. Uh, to winning uh, even games because a lot of games last year was, was also even but we always managed to find a way to, to win them uh, and a lot of the games this year is going to be even as well so we just have to find that that uh, uh, just have to find a way to win those even games and then we will hopefully not be down there yeah I'm sure you have uh, an awful lot of momentum but, uh, but anyway thanks very much for your time on the Nordic Football Podcast Jonas and uh uh, it was great having you on the show. It was great actually having a defender. Uh, we often it's the strikers and the attackers who get more of the attention. So fantastic to have someone uh, give us a bit of tactical insight down there. And uh, maybe we'll speak to you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very fun. much. Beer. Okay, that was a brilliant interview, uh, and we'll be back after the break to talk more elitist Aryan stuff. So see you again very soon. <laughs> Welcome back, and yes, that was an enjoyable interview there with Jonas Corona. Uh, very enjoyable, Steve. Tell us the outlook about his club, in fact, because you've got a prediction for them, haven't you? Whereabouts do you see them this season? What's the outlook for Arlesund, uh, who are new boys in the league this season? Yeah, well, I'm predicting uh, Arlesund 11th in the table. Um, actually, I think 6th to uh, 13th is going to be really close. Um, literally, nothing would surprise me. I think the bottom three are going to be adrift. I'll talk about them in a minute. But, uh, yeah, 6th or 13th could be anything. All of a sudden, in 11th, I mean, I personally think they're an exciting team. Uh, the best of the newly promoted teams by uh, a country mile, in my opinion. I'm really excited to see Simon Nordley and Nicholas Castro in action. And also Jordan Much, actually. Um, I think he'll go pretty well in Norway. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're an exciting side, uh, exciting side uh, well coached by Lars Bohinen, who, who knows how to do it now at this level of football. And, uh, you know, they're going to be something different because their formation is going to be sort of 3-1, 4-2. And you don't see that too often, do you? 
uh, anywhere really, um, certainly not in Norway. So there'll be a really interesting side to watch. I would recommend to a lot of people to catch some of their games. And uh, yeah, it was really interesting talking to, to Jonas Groner there um, on the interview. And once again, we thank him uh, for his time. And uh, all of a sudden, I think they'll be absolutely fine. They, I, mean, I put him 11th, but it could easily be better. It could easily be a couple of places worse. It's really hard to predict at the minute from 6 to 13. Yeah, you think this is going to be quite hard to call, don't you, the, the, this uh, remaining section in terms of mid-table? You, you see a lot of um, you know teams that are quite level in terms of quality, and you, you've gone for Strums Godset in sixth. Yeah, this is my wild card sort of joker selection. I think everyone's got to have one, haven't they? When you predict a leak, um, sort of a, a random one where people look at that and think, "What the absolute fuck," you know. And this is the uh, this is my one. Strums good sir, as high as six. Um, but uh, you know me, I'm a big one for managers, and um, I'm actually going to be. I'm talking up the manager here, Henrik Pedersen, who we we interviewed last year, and just having talked to him a few times, he. Um, he is incredible, in my opinion. His his mental awareness and tactics are spot on. And uh, you look at some of the signings they brought in, and you're like, oh, "Who's he then?" Or what about him? You know, he's not going to be that good, is he? But I do know they have a proper uh, scouting system that they they identify the right players for their system, not just tactically, but also within the squad. So Pedersen is a fantastic manager, um, but. To put it briefly, I think Yanis Ikorniak is going to be a great addition for them on the wings. They've got Salverson up front, who's a really big guy. Uh, Mikko Maegaard is a new captain and uh, was inspirational for them second half of last season. The doubt for Strums Goodser is in defence. Um, certainly centre-back is a little bit wavy, perhaps, but they've got Villersrick and Parr out wide at the back. Um, and, you know, I think they've got goals in them and they've got, you know, a great system in place. So, uh Look, why not Strum's got to turn six? Someone's got to overachieve, haven't they, from that bunch? Um, so I'm going to go with them. It might be a bit optimistic, but uh, I think they're going to have a good season. Fantastic stuff. And, yeah, we, we did have the, the manager on the, on, on the podcast, didn't we, before? So, uh, yeah, you can always listen back to that as well. Go back into our archives and make sure you uh, hit that subscribe button. Steve, uh, you want to give us a – you want to read out the sort of plug, yeah. maybe, a few things we want to plug before we continue? Yeah, I think we'd better, actually. Um this is uh, obviously uh, let's start with our own socials uh, at Nordic Foot Pod on Twitter. Give us a follow if you haven't already. Um, give me a follow as well while you're at it at Meatman Soccer and uh, at JF Football for you, uh, John. But uh, you know what? There's some really good elite Assyrian content around uh, these days, which I'm going to talk about soon. But uh, you may have noticed we've got a new logo for Nordic Football Podcast, which was designed by a great friend of the pod, Joe Gold. Give him a follow on Twitter at uh, Tolve North, um, a top guy who uh, gave us some great designs. And it went to a public vote and we've ended up with this uh, turquoise one, which uh, I think it looks beautiful, you know, a really clean image. And uh, really uh, massive thanks to Joe for, for taking the time to to create some designs for us there. Give him a follow, everyone. Um, I mentioned some great elite Assyrian content. Um, there's some great Twitter accounts uh, and some uh, podcasts and uh, YouTube channels worth following. Uh, ben Wells, uh, got to mention Ben, haven't we? Uh, he's a, a top guy up there in Norway, knows his stuff. Um, you know, tweets uh, obviously in English and uh, definitely give Ben Wells a follow if you've not already. Um, uh, we've got uh, Heskibo, uh, who was second in our fantasy uh, Elite Serian last year. Uh, give him a follow. He's been doing some podcasts um, about fantasy football in the Faroe Islands as well. Um, so uh, FPL, uh, sorry, not FPL, first, at Heskibo underscore ESN is a, a great account to follow on Twitter. Um, and then uh, I've really been uh, interested in uh, a guy called uh, Kun Karam, uh, at Karam Taser. Um, they do an Elite Assyrian Fantasy a YouTube channel um, with a guy called Espen, um, Espen Ness. Give, uh, check out that channel. I'm gonna. I'll link it in the um, for those watching on YouTube. But they uh, do a lot of early Tessarian fantasy uh, fantasy stuff. Uh, I say there's some really great content at the moment about fantasy, and we've got, we're going to have some of our own on the YouTube channels. We've had people asking about this. I'm personally going to be doing a, a video for all the teams, small videos uh, with fantasy advice on the Nordic Football Podcast fan, um, YouTube channel. So look out for those coming on Monday um, for every single team. So uh, and you can also join the Nordic Football Podcast uh, Fantasy League, 
um all the details will be left on tweets so yeah plenty going on plenty of really good content out there in scandinavia now uh from a, an english speaking point of view jonathan and it's great to see yeah most definitely and I, yeah i can also endorse those guys most definitely um we, we catch them on twitter all the time and they're good follows and yeah don't forget of course as well we are also on facebook nordic football podcast go uh, have a little look of that if you'd like and also patreon if you want to support us uh, with uh, you know the price of a pint and or whatever you know a cake or whatever you want to call it but yeah i mean we've got three different tiers we've changed the tiers this season so uh, we've got the erling brow harland tier uh, and that is just for contributions in terms of financial support to help us make better episodes and better content and uh, you know if we do get some patrons then we'll look at some bonus podcasts as well but uh, as it stands of course the podcast is free and always will be free but that's just if you want to um, offer an extra tier of support let's move on back to things in Norway Steve because we're now down to seventh and you've got a team there that you know some people might not expect I suppose yeah let me just read through this list that I'm going from sixth to thirteenth I've got Strums Good Sir I'm predicting them sixth Argersund in seventh Buda Glimt in eighth Odd ninth Starbeck tenth Olsund eleventh Sarsborg twelfth and Christiansen thirteenth that is the lineup I'm going with. And like I said, I found this section really difficult. You could make a case for anyone really to finish in these spots. But all of a sudden, just a solid side. Um, they've got a really rock solid defense, uh, John. They've got uh, Benjamin Karamoko back, uh, ex uh, Sanity and guy who was injured all last year. He's going to be a big uh, bonus. Alexander Sturlas on the left hand side. He's going to start the season a little bit lacking like uh, match fitness after injury, but. Um, Stolas is unbelievable. He takes all the set pieces. He's got an insane, insane long throw. Great technical left back for Horgerson and a big fantasy man. Uh, but they've got like Desler, Benjamin Hansen as well, Knudsen. So really rock solid defence. And they've got enough sort of weapons in midfield and attack as well, just to keep them competitive. And they had a good run in Europe last year, well managed, and there was good rotation. I, I like the, the teams that have had proven rotation in the past, certainly last season. I really like them side this year because we know they can do it and get results at the same time. And Hogerson know uh, what they're doing in that regard. They're uh, they're not going to be snazzy. They're not going to be that fancy. But they'll do just enough. And they've got Ibrahim Avaji coming back on in mid, I think it's 16th of July. He was banned for something like nearly a year because of a doping um, substance abuse, whatever you want to call it. Um, but he's back. That's a big bonus for him, getting him back up front. He's a big physical striker. Who will get them goals? So I like Hogerson to have a solid season again. They were seventh last year, I think seventh again. Is my man Bruno Lighty still there? He is. That they're a little bit light in midfield this year because they've lost uh, Sandre Tronstad. He was a big player. Light, uh, yeah, he's going to be the main man probably in midfield now. Um, Tronstad's gone. Um, that's probably the one question mark area right in the centre of the park. Perhaps they're lacking a little bit, but. Um, yeah, they've got a um, good mixture of uh, experience and youth, uh, and the manager seems to know what he's doing. 4-4, four, 1-1 four, one, one formation, they say nothing fancy. Um, I just have a good feeling about the club. They know what they're doing there, you know, they're, they're experienced. and Yeah, they'll, they'll be solid. They'll be solid enough. There are some good games and a few bad ones as well, but um, they've got enough about them to get certainly inside the top 10 comfortably. You yeah, know, the one team that we haven't mentioned yet, and it does surprise me a little bit, I'll be honest, um, is Buda Glimt now? Arguably, they were the story of last season, weren't they? And we had their um, sporting director, Asman Bjorkan, on the podcast at, towards the back end of last season. Uh, you can go back and listen to that episode as well. A uh, fantastic chat about transfers and and you know their system of bringing in quite good young players. You've got them down in eighth this season. I mean, they've got a uh, European campaign coming up. Um, they were the story of last year, Steve. What has been happening? since then and why have you got them so much further down the league this season i think i believe you had them to be relegated last year didn't you well, <laughs> most people did <laughs> this is an absolute misconception i was one of the few pundits out there <laughs> who actually uh, had them predicting to do all right i think i had them predicted 11th okay my so, mistake my mistake so um yeah i i was quite high on booty last year and uh, i'm just being realistic you know i just see I say how it is, and um, look, they, they they were brilliant last year, and they're they're another team fantastically managed by Jesse Knudsen. It's uh, it's funny, isn't it? A lot of the best managers are in the middle of the pack here uh, of elitist area, but um, yeah, he's doing fantastically well. But hey, when you have a season like that, there's always downsides, and that teams want your players, 
Hakon Hakonevian's already gone to AZ. Looks like Jens Peter Halger's going to be sold to uh, a team in Belgium. It's one of the Bruges clubs, I think. Uh, everyone in Scandinavia seems to end up in Belgium, don't they, these days? For about a year. They're like waffles or something, you know. It's um, bloody hell. But uh, so they're losing him. Um, who else? They lost another. They lost their right back, Erlen Reitan, who's back uh, to Rosenborg after a really successful loan spell. Um, they've lost the goalkeeper, Ricardo Friedrich. And um, you know, look, as I say, fucking hell. <laughs> Get away. Hold on. Mm. Fucking creature. You've got drama. You've got drama live on air. Bloody creature. He, he fell off me. Well, the has been attacked by a cat in mid show. <laughs> right, let me, let me recompose myself. Sit down. <laughs> Fucking hell. Where was I? Middle, I was middle of the things on this podcast in my time, but uh, millionaire physically, <laughs> physically attacked by a cat. That's that's new to me. <laughs> he obviously must support Gordon well, Glimp. Oh man, man, I should bloody. <laughs> it's one of those that might not even, might not even edit it out. It's so dramatic. But um, be a Gordon Glimp fan. <laughs> my word. Anyway, yeah, he's obviously. Anyway, let me get on with Gordon Glimp. Uh, biggest problem is goalkeeper. Uh, they've just got just recently signed a guy from the second division in, in uh, Holland, uh, Joshua Smith. Look, who knows how good he's going to be? He looks a big unit to me. They've uh, signed uh, Marius Hobart and from Sanderfjord and a couple of other guys. At left back Frederick Andre Bjerkan is still there. He's a top uh, top left back, obviously massive boost to have kept him. Fred and Moe, Marius Loder, fast physical defenders. Uh, Sammy Skitt, a defensive mid, come in. Uh, he was at Starbeck on loan last year. And they've got the likes of Ulrich Soutners, Patrick Berg, who are, who are good midfielders. There's enough quality here. They're well coached. They're going to be 4-3-3 attack, really strong on the counter-attack. And uh, that'll play in their favour. Uh, but it's unrealistic to expect they're going to be up there again because they're going to be in Europe as well. So when these qualifiers come, um, who knows how far they'll go. But I've seen sides like them sort of struggle with that before. Um and look, when you lose someone like FVN and a couple of other big pieces, La Uni, he started at the back end of last year with losing La Uni uh, as well. Um, it's just hard to recover from it, Jonathan, isn't it? And I don't see them in that top five hunt myself. They'll be top 10. And maybe I'm being a little bit pessimistic with eight. They could maybe be the sixth place side. But I think it's realistic. We've got to expect they're going to drop down a little bit, you know? Yeah, I mean, I noticed they signed um, a player from Sweden, Alphonse Samstead from Nor Shopping. I uh, didn't have a great run of it there, but he's still a young player. I wonder if that's that's one I'm going to be looking out for because um, I'm interested to see how how he does and what the thinking is behind that one. Um, but in general, they've only you know they brought in quite a lot of money. In fact, they brought in about three quarters, seventy five percent of the uh, entire money brought into Norway in terms of transfers. Um, most of that on Evian and Layuni alone. Uh, but they've only forked out you know in terms of major fees for Sammy Skitter, twenty three year old from. Mitchelland and Kasper Juncker uh, from Horsens. Uh, and then Ola Solbak and the only three players they've played, paid money for. Will, will that pay off? Or, you know, should they be going for it now when they've got a bit of cash in the bank? I think all of, all of those signings are good ones. Skitter and Juncker were on loan in, in Norway last year at different clubs and did well. Solbak is a nice young talent from Ranheim who can develop. It fits into the system really well. Sondre Fett has come in from Olesen, actually a left winger. Um, who's an interesting player, good uh, technically and physically. Um, so, look, they've, they've put in some good players. And, hey, there's going to be more money coming in from the Jens Petter Holger transfer probably soon. So, hey, I think Budi Glimt are far from finishing the transfer market, Jonathan. It's just a question of who they bring in. Um, but um, it's hard, isn't it, when you bring so many new guys in and, and you lose players. Um, they'll go well. They're a good side to watch on the eye. But it could be uh, just sort of rebalancing again. Maybe, maybe re rebuilding again for sort of 2021, where they may well sort of rise up once more to uh, to challenge for medal positions. Yeah, and I have to say, you know, just before we move on, for me, they were the best team to watch last season in Norway. I thought they were fantastic. Uh, and they did offer value for money as well. 64 goals scored, 44 conceded. So, um, you know, they're going to need to keep that scoring rate up if they're going to improve because 44 is a fair amount to concede compared to Mulder's 31. Um, let's move on. And the next four teams you've got are Odd in ninth, Starbeck 10th, Arlison, as you mentioned there, 11th, and Sarpsborg 12th. Now, Sarpsborg, is that a little bit low for them? You know, and uh, even Odd, 
you know, Oddwood, you know, much higher up the table last season. Give us the rationale behind these uh, these next four teams, Steve. Odd star back. Well, odd star back in Sarpsborg. Yeah, yeah. Odd. Uh, I've obviously lost for Germo, the big manager. Um, and I think that's going to take some settling down. His number two assistant um, has taken over there. So uh, th- th- he knows the team. Not much is going to change in system and everything. But I've got a big problem with Odd. Uh, Dergil Bourbon, obviously, was the top scorer last year in the league. Um, but his contract runs out. I think it's the end of uh, July. Or I don't know the exact date, but um, anyway, um, it looks like he doesn't want to re-sign for them. So he's going to be on the move potentially to maybe someone like Rosenborg or even beyond uh, the league. So look, if you lose Berven, look, that's just taking a massive player away from the squad. So they're going to have to replace him. Uh, simple as that. And we don't know at this point who is going to come in for Berven, do we? So that's my big concern with Odd. And my other concern with them is the lack of depth uh, in the squad. They've got quality. Um, the starting eleven is quite good, but after that, uh, yeah, he'd not got an awful lot, and that's concerning in a in a, in a year um, where you need fresh bodies. And they've got quite a few older players, so I think they'll drop down to ninth. They might even drop lower if they can't replace Bourbon. Starbeck in tenth. They are the easily the hardest side to predict, mate. Um, they could be absolutely anything. Uh, well managed by Ann Johnson. Always some great young players that come through their academy. Uh, a couple of interesting signs, Roman Gaul. Uh, will interest you, uh, ex Malmo, obviously. Um, Cornelius Hansen, uh, talent from Southampton. Um, so, uh, look, they're uh, Starbeck, uh, easily the hardest side to predict. I put them 10th right in the middle there. That this mid table bunch, it could be anywhere for Starbeck. I've got a feeling there might be a pleasant surprise. And uh, we go to you know, Sarsborg, and um, yeah, 12th might be low for them. Uh, there's, there's, all these sides that I've predicted sort of 10th and below might think, oh, we can do a lot better than that. And I would agree with them. And they've got a new manager, Sartsborg, got Mikkel Stara, who you might remember from his time in uh, in Sweden. There was it Hecken. Um, but he had a shocking spell at San Jose Earthquakes. Um, he could hardly win a game there. He was, I don't know what went wrong for Stara. He played 4-4-2 in, in MLS, but he's actually switching the system um, to 3-4-3 at Sartsborg. And you don't sit, again, it's not a formation you see very often, is it? Certainly not in Norway. So, Three four three um, with uh, sort of wing backs, but also wingers. So um, they, they might go all right, uh, Sarsborg. A lot is resting on uh, the striker Jurgen Strand Larsen, who this time last year was meant to be the big thing, wasn't he? You know, going to be break out and score a lot of goals, but it didn't happen. Maybe this is the year for Strand Larsen to deliver. Um, but uh, you know, they've got some good players on paper, Sarsborg. Um, and they could easily do better than 12. But, uh, you know, what, how, Star are gonna, how is this 3 4 3 going to work in a competitive match? That's my question mark. You know, let's see how they go. And they could be a pleasant surprise. But um, I think uh, 12 maybe is about right for them. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of Starbeck on Romain Gaul, I think I really do think um, he, could, he could go well if you can get, if Starbeck can get the best out of him. I think he's been misused at Malmo. Uh, he was really good at Gifts since Val. Question marks maybe about his, his his mentality to a certain extent because he did have some bus stops at Malmo. Um, can he, you know, is he better suited off maybe a slightly smaller club? Because it didn't work out for him under two managers, Uwe Rosler, and now obviously on now Thomason, and he's been loaned out. So, um, but I think he could be a good player to be honest in, in elite Serie, and so he could he could be definitely one to watch. In terms of Mikistari, yeah, he's um, he, he did did okay at hacking. Uh, I was fairly surprised when he left. Um, well, not when he left, but I just fairly, fairly surprised by his career tra- trajectory since. But um, it seems like he's changing his formation, which is which is interesting. Uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, is there uh, out of this bottom? I mean, on on Mickey Star before I move on. Yeah, I mean, I remember him as a sort of tactically conservative coach on the, in in the games I saw. So I'm quite surprised about what you say there. He didn't tend to risk it really. Um, one thing I noted about him at Hacking is he never pushed on or risk games to chase a win. He was always quite happy to just sit and, um, you know, lock up a draw or lock up a, you know, win if he was hold, holding on for one or wouldn't go all out for it if they're losing um, too often. So I'm surprised to hear maybe, maybe he's changed. Maybe he's evolved in America. Maybe he's seen uh, new experiences. Uh, I've got one question for you there, Steve. Of those sort of middle tier of teams, who would you say are the top three players in that bracket of, of any club? Oh, goodness. Um, what, from 6th to 13th? Yeah, anyone from uh, you know the teams we just mentioned. Yeah, Nicholas Castro, but Alison, um, probably 
Frederick Andre Bjorken at Buda Glimt and Turgil Bourbon at odd there. But there's quite a lot of there's still quite a lot of talent in the, in this section, which is why there's lots of potential fluctuation, you know. Um, and just going back to Mikel Stara, yeah, I think he might be a changed man because in MLS is so gung ho attack. But what I noticed there was a, a real reluctance from him to change his starters very often. Um, you know, he stuck with the same system all the time, very predictable with his substitutions. And I just worry about that at Sarsborg. It's quite a big squad. He needs to rotate. All the teams are going to have to rotate as much as they can this year. There's no, you can't keep playing guys Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. So he's going to have to look at rotating around a bit. And uh, look, until I see it on the field, I'm a bit, I'm quite optimistic for Sarsborg, but. Let's just see how the system works because it's an intricate one, isn't it? If the wing backs are not performing and there is a, they've got a guy at right wing back who could be very raw, um, then it could be a weak spot, couldn't it? But, um, you know, 6th or 13th could be anything. I suppose I'd better mention Christiansen actually before we do move on to the bottom three. Christiansen, very well managed by uh, Mickelson, is a top manager. Uh, and again, I could have put them higher, but I just feel like uh, maybe a lack of depth there. Potential injury worries with some of their key players like Castrati, Pellegrino, can they stay fit? Top guys when they're on the field, but often on the treatment table. Um, and Sean McDermott, their goalkeeper, their big man, one of the top keepers in the league, he's out for about three months with a thumb ligament, a torn thumb ligament. He had surgery on it, and he's going to be out till probably September, which is a massive blow for them. Uh, he, he saved so many shots. Uh, Christensen, not a bad side. Should uh, still have enough comfortably to avoid a relegation battle, but um, yeah, I've got them 13th this year. Yeah, and they've also got uh, Flemming Castrati, haven't they? Who's not a bad player. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, Steve, I mean, uh, am I wrong there about Castrati? I might be wrong, actually. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you about them is they, they've got games I've seen, they've got quite a tight ground, haven't they? Um, mm. I remember a game when they beat Rosenborg. Uh, are they going to struggle with this new sort of, lock, you know, no fans? Are they going to be a team that might, might, might lose out from that? Is that what you factored in in your prediction for them to finish uh, 13th? Exactly that. Um, I think I put this in my season preview that I put on my website. Um, it's only a 4,000 capacity, capacity stadium, but you wouldn't know it. The fans are right on your back. They're so passionate. Great atmosphere as well. They're going to miss that hugely. And they've had a fantastic home record um, in the last uh, since they got promoted. So they're going to. That is a factor I've put in. It is a couple of sides you could make that point about. Um, me and Darl, and we're going to talk about them in a minute. That might be a negative for them. Uh, maybe odd as well. They've been really good at home in the last few years and um, it could uh, affect them uh, in a negative way. So, yeah, Christiansen, they, they may easily prove... Every year, Christiansen proved me wrong, by the way. I keep, I've keep i never predicted them that high, but they always do much better than I expect. So, hey, I'm kind of expecting Christian Mickelson to say, up yours again, meet Man Soccer, and, uh, and sort of end up uh, around 7th uh, or 8th or something. But... But sooner or later, they're going to have sort of a down year, and this may well be it. Castrati, yes, uh, is a top player, really good striker for, 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 for them. If you could guarantee that he would stay fit, he's getting 10, 15 goals, uh, Jonathan. But um, look, he won't stay fit. He'll get injured at some point. It always happens. Fascinating stuff. And yeah, as you mentioned, they finished sixth last season, uh, 11 wins and 11 defeats, uh, and 41 goals scored, 41 conceded. So, you know, pretty. Uh, for those of you who like symmetry, they were the teams to support. Um, okay, let's move on to the bottom now. Uh, relegation. Three three places left. Of course, one of them goes to the playoffs and two of them are relegated. So, uh, well, there's only three teams remaining, aren't there? We've got uh, Mion Dallin, IK Star and Sandy Fjord. So, jumble them around, Steve, and who you got going down? And who? Well, let's start with who have you got surviving? Who have you got in 14th place? Yeah, I've got Mion Dahl in 14th, starting 15th, and Sandefjord 16th. 14th place is the playoff game against the uh, the team that wins the uh, Obos League and playoffs, of course. But I'd see these three sides, they're just, I think they're going to be cast adrift at the bottom. I just think they're clearly the worst three on paper in the league. Um, um, what, I mean, I think I see Sandefjord absolutely rock bottom. I think it's between start and Mion Dahl for this 14th, 15th slot. Mion Dahl and themselves. Um, we had a we had their manager on the podcast last year, um, which you can listen to a fascinating interview. I think I really rate him highly. Actually, Vegar Hansen, he's a legend at the club. He's been there for absolute years. He lives at the stadium. Uh, the manager lives at the stadium, uh, one of the apartments there. And um, 
you know, you've got to give him a lot of credit for what he's done. Uh, the club with limited resources, they did fan, absolutely fantastic to um, sort of survive last season. It, um, what, what they actually performed was a miracle, really. Uh, last day of the season, they, they beat Volarenga 1-0. Um, a dramatic sort of win. If they had not won that game, they would have gone directly down. Uh, wouldn't have been even the case of a playoff match. Um, and look, you know, he, he was in the conversation last year for manager of the season uh, behind, um, you know, the Buda Glimt and uh, Viking bosses. Um, did really well. Hansen's a great tactician. They will change their system regularly. He's not um, afraid of getting ugly either. You know, he's going to be um, digging in to get a result if they need one. And there's, there's enough weapons here. Uh, Mjern Dahlen to, to keep them competitive. The defence is underrated. Uh, Sandra Johansson, uh, Nakim is a new signing, Quint Jansen. They've got some uh, decent players. They're going to lose. They've lost Julian Firelund, the goalkeeper, who was he made a lot of saves last year. Um, so they're, they're downgraded in the goalkeeping department. Um, but they've got a lot of experienced old heads here. Um, but I do worry about their lack of uh, firepower, especially, and, and just general quality sort of in the final third of the field. Um, they're going to hope that they're going to have to hope that a lot of returning low knees and a few youngsters perform for them along with a couple of old dogs. Um, so just on paper, the quality is not really there, but they will be as competitive as they, as they can be. Hanson will get the absolute most out of his squad <coughs> in terms of results. No doubt about that whatsoever. And I think ultimately that will edge them over the, uh, the likes of Start and Sanderfield and, um, and, and enable them to finish 14th. But I just... Unless one of the other teams that I mentioned, there probably will be one, won't there, that we, in that mid-table bunch that has a shocking season. Um, but I don't see many others dropping into this sort of bottom three battle. Uh, Mjern Darlin, let's say 14th, just the lack of quality on paper, the resources. Yeah, I must say last season I did enjoy um, the interview with Eli Hansen. I think that was one of the best uh, part, uh, manager interviews uh, from a Norway perspective, certainly that I listened to. It was fascinating. And again, go back to our archives. You can get all these interviews. We've had so many uh, insightful managers and guests on the show in the past year, and we will continue to have more as this season goes along. So um, a lot planned with the season to come. I mean, Steve, apart from probably Christoph Psyche, I think you know my favourite uh, my favourite name in in, in, uh, in Norwegian football is Oliver Ossian. But he's uh, he's no longer there, is he? He was their top scorer last year and he's gone. Um, I mean, at the moment, I don't really know who's going to start up front for them. They've brought in a guy called Ibrahim Shuaribu, who um, was a Horgerson guy. He had one of the in mo in most incredible misses I've ever seen in the Elite Serien uh, a couple of years ago, actually. A, a talent that's never really been fulfilled. Maybe this is going to be his year. But I just don't see a striker that's going to really worry the defences uh, too much you know they've got wingers and, and sort of attacking midfielders who are good uh, Brockman and, and, and Garseth who are not bad it's just that they're going to have to hope they've got about six strikers on the books right youngsters or returning low knees they've just got to hope that one of them fires uh, and is unexpectedly good you know that's that's the hope maybe that can happen if, if that can happen they might do a little bit better than I expect yeah, fantastic stuff. And um, yeah, as you mentioned there, Shaibu, Lau, Ibrahim, a lot will rest on his, his shoulders, I imagine. But you, you know, you seem to think uh, they've got enough to, to avoid relegation. So, uh, well, let's look at those two. Uh, yeah, just, I mean, just we'll do six goals in 10 games in the old Boss League game for uh, Shaibu last season. So, you know, maybe he can carry the can. But, you know, like you said, there's a lot of, um, a lot of pressure on his shoulders. Uh, that was his record at Kongsvinger. Let's look at the bottom two then. You've gone for a couple of promoted teams, haven't you? Yeah, I've gone with Start in 15th and uh, Sandefjord 16th. I'll just go with Start. And look, you remember the last time they came up, Jonathan, with uh, Mark Dempsey in charge. A lot was expected of them and they flopped massively, didn't they? I think this time around, there's much less expectations on their shoulders. Um, but I look at this squad and it's mostly Obosl again, class really. There's not enough sort of uh, top level ability. Um, I mean, briefly got a good goalkeeper in Jonas Doimerland and they're going to need him to be good because he's going to be tested quite a lot. Um, they signed Henrik Jezgal, a centre-back, but he's out injured with an uh, ACL damage, so that's a blow. Um, I mean, Eric Richner at right-back is not too bad. Eric Schultz is coming from Song now in the Obos League, and I'm excited about him, a prospect which definitely deserved a uh, move up to the Elite Serien. 
And in uh, Afiz Arima at D-mid, he's not a bad player. Martin Ramsland up front, he's a good target man striker, physical sort of bloke who got them in. That hat-trick he scored against Lillestrom in the playoff last year was sensational, of course. And you've got the sort of sprinklings of qualities like Kevin Cabran, who was once on my player to uh, watch this, wasn't he, just a couple of years ago. He didn't really do anything. And, uh, you know, they've brought in a guy from uh, ooh, Lillestrom, uh, Eric uh, Brendan, I think. Uh, is it Brendan? No, that's right, Sanderfield. I'm getting mixed up. Sorry, Stefan uh, Lee Stjalovec has come in from uh, Sarpsborg, but he's a bit of a, j- a journeyman, really. More, mm, his, his technical technicals are not that great. He's more of a trier than anything. I just don't see enough quality in the squad uh, for them to be competitive. But uh, look, they've got promoted. They've, they've got that promoting promotion bounce, which might help them out. But it's got to be a year fighting against the drop for me. Um, I mean, they might make the, the playoff game, but um, I did, I'm not expecting too much from the start. Yeah, and they lost their most recent uh, preseason friendly 4 0 to Sarpsborg. So um, maybe that's a, worry, a bit of a worry. Um, what about Sandifield then? Because they're back and they've kept their manager, haven't they, from uh, last the last sort of relegation campaign uh, last season, uh, the season before, sorry. Well, I mean, this looks painful, really. Um... It's just an horrendous. I mean, look at this squad on paper, and I do really worry for them. There's just no depth here. They've lost their three, their best three or four players from last season, John. Um, Marius Herbratton in defence, gone to Buda Glimt. Pontus Engblom, um, who scored, who was involved in about 50% of their goals last year, He's uh, he moved to Sweden. It might have been Sundsvall, I'm not sure. But uh, so that was a massive loss there. And also uh, off Kier and Tito from midfield. And, you know, they've not really brought in anyone that catches my eye. Zé Eduardo is a Brazilian. Um, who's a, he's, he's probably, I think, had about 10 or 15 clubs. He's only 28, 28 year old. Uh, so he might be a wild card to, to watch out for. Eric Brendan from Lillestrom is not a bad signing out wide. And they've got a classy sort of left winger attacking midfield in Rufo. But they've not got a striker of note. George Gibson, I've seen a few people mention he's a young talent to watch out for. He didn't even start a game for them last year. In the old boss of the game so you're not telling me someone who doesn't start a game they're suddenly going to become their 10 uh, 10 goal man at the top level it's just not going to happen uh there's a lack of depth so they're not going to be able to rotate very well uh the goalkeepers look awful um <laughs> jesus i mean the, the there's not much positive to say about sanderfield's squad the manager's good i really like the manager marty sifuentes i rate him i'd love to get him on this podcast one day actually marty if you are listening uh, he's probably not not going to want to come on, is he? The way I'm kind of slagging off the team. Um, but, um, you know, let's be realistic here. I think he's going to get the most out of his squad. He's a good manager, 4 2 3 1 formation. They're going to be as compact as they can. I think they'll frustrate some teams from time to time. Um, but uh, look, just the depth isn't there, the quality's not there. But maybe they can do some good deals before the end of June that might save them. So let's not write them off too soon. But on paper, this is the worst squad. And it's just hard uh, to see anything other than rock bottom, to be honest with you, Jonathan. I just think losing key players like that and not really replacing them is, is just a crippling blow. Who would you say is the top player? You know, the one that's going to, if they've got any kind of hope, who's it going to, who's it, will it rest? Who's the Rufo for me, the attacking midfielder left winger, he actually did pretty well. Uh, remember, they were in the elite Serie in 2018. And he came in the second half of the season, scored goals at this level. So he's proven himself um, here. And he had a pretty decent year in the Obusle again, too. He's a touch of quality that might just give him some hope. Um, but there's not an awful lot else of it, unless some guys develop or, or really surprise us. Well, if anyone remembers last season's relegation battle, it really was probably one of the best you might ever see. Uh, four teams ended up on 30 points. Uh, it was, went down to the final day. It was one of the best relegation battles I've ever seen in, in my life, to be honest, in terms of points and goal difference and everything. Mjolnir and escaped, uh, but you've got them to be in the relegation playoffs again. And so let's just go through your table, final table. Then you've got 16th, Sandefjord, 15th, IK Start, 14th, Mjolnir, 13th, Christiansen, 12th, Sarpsborg, 11th, Arlesund, 10th, Starbeck, 9th, Odd. Into the top half, you've got uh, well, mid table, Buddha Glimt in eighth, seventh, Haugesund, sixth, Strums Godset, fifth, Viking, fourth, Bran, third, Wallerenga, second, Rosenborg, and to make it champions back to back, you've got Mulder in first. Fantastic stuff, uh, Steve. Yeah, that's how I see the table going this year. Um, like I say, six to uh, 13th. Re- there's so many 
teams in that midsection that are uh, hard to predict. And uh, hey, that's good, isn't it, for the league? It's going to be uh, there's a lot of evenly matched teams there. Um, but let's hope we get plenty of drama at the top and the bottom. You know, I hope it's not the case of the bottom three get cut adrift. I hope I'm I hope I'm wrong, and then we get it much closer. You know, but um, you know, that's how I see it. And uh, yeah, let's hope for a good season. Yeah, fantastic stuff. And uh, the opening round of games starts uh, this Tuesday, in fact. And it's fantastic news if you were in England because uh, the games are going to be brought to you live, aren't they, on, in, in, on English TV? Yeah, first, certainly the first three rounds, Eurosport you, uh, in England, are going to be showing at least two, round, uh, two games per round, I think sometimes more. So, yeah, um, 5 p.m. on uh, Tuesday. Get Eurosport on if you're watching from the UK and we can watch uh, Lita Serian football for the first time. So uh, I hope that it's continued for more than three rounds and that it gets some good viewers. Um, you know, all right, it's not the most uh, high quality league, but um, it's uh, great that it has a chance to showcase, um, you know, outside uh, of Norway a bit more. Yeah, and the games that you can watch uh, on that day, I think, are well. I mean, in terms of the highlights of the first round, we've got Arles and Mulder there looking to, you know, newly relic, newly promoted against the champions. Uh, and you've got you know, plenty of other games um, to look out for. And you did mention there that it's, you know, an exciting league to come and there's going to be some exciting players, isn't there? Now that brings us on to our 10 players to watch for the season ahead. Now, we do have a partnership with y Scout, um, the leading scouting and data analysis platform. Uh, and... We're delighted to have already featured some of these on, on our Wisecut blog. We're doing a regular Wisecut blog again this year. Uh, every month we'll be bringing out new articles uh, for them, delving into the stats and the ana analytics. And some of them feature in your 10 to watch, don't they, Steve? Do you want to sort of give us an overview of your 10 to watch and we'll have a quick chat about them? Let's go with the 10 list here. Nicholas Castro, uh, Olison, Yanis uh, Ikoniak, good sir. Uh, Christopher Clay, uh, Klaassen, uh, Volarenga, Odin Biertoff to Odd. Robert Taylor, Brand, Anton Salathros, Sartsborg, Hugo Vettelson at Starbeck, Marcus Holmgren, Pedersen, Mulder, Patrick Berg at uh, Buda Glimt, and uh, Adrian Nielsen Pereira at Viking. These are a lot of my young talents that to keep your eye on, but there's a few older players who are more well known. Uh, these are 10 players to watch for, for whatever reason. Yeah, now you generally, you know, you do like your sort of older, slightly more experienced player than my, you know, list of teenagers. Um, what attracts you to Nicholas Castro? Because he's first on your list, 24-year-old at Arlesund. Um, and he, you've also written about him as well. But what, what attracts you to him? I mean, he's, he's new to the league, the top division. What, what attracts yeah. you? Yeah, I mean, we, talk, we talked about this in the interview with uh, Jonas Groner, and um, he's a really exciting talent. Chilean um, international now, and he absolutely tore up. He's tore up the Obersl again the last two years. 17 goals, 11 assists, and 24 appearances in 2019. And he, he, he's classy, got insane technical abilities, uh, great from set pieces. He's got the skill set. 24 year old, um, but uh, you know, that, in a way, that's a good age, though, isn't it? Some of these players, you know, he's a bit more experienced. He knows his game more, um, and I, I just think he could fit. He could probably start for any team in this league, even the big boys. You know, um, that's how good he is. Obviously, there's always a question mark in the coming up, so I'm really interested to see him. But um, I just think sheer. I love to see classy players, and Norway, the elite Serien doesn't have enough of these skillful guys. So um, I, I really hope he has a good season. Yeah, he looks, you know, he looks a talent from what you said. Very productive. Is he is he on penalties, you know, set pieces? Is he a fantasy team prospect? Oh, yes. I mean, he's obviously, uh, you yeah, know, look at my Olsen video, fantasy video, he will be discussed there. I think you've got to think about including him. He can play as striker or sort of, he's going to be more in that sort of uh, creative central midfield or sort of shadow strike, if you want to call it that. Um, yeah, but he can play anywhere in that attacking third. And uh, I'm expecting a big, big year from Nicolas Castro. Yeah, and his record, 40 goals, 32 assists in 77 appearances in the Obos League game. Uh, he has played in the Elite Serien as well, nine appearances uh, in the past uh, for Vellerenga, in fact. So, um, but didn't have as, wasn't as prolific at that point. That was in 2016. So a massive player to watch out for, according to Meat Man Soccer. Who's next on the list? And you've got Yanis Ikauniak. So we did, in fact, talk about him haven't we, before. We have. Uh, we've talked about him on an episode. I can't remember exactly which one it was, but I did give him a good 10 minute uh, talk there. So I won't go into too much detail again uh, to bore you. But what what he has done, he's uh, been looking really good form 
in the friendly matches of late. I think he scored three and three. And it doesn't surprise me at all. I know this guy's style and um, he'll cut inside from the right wing. And, um, you know, if his finishing boots are on, I mean, he'll create chances for himself. He doesn't always finish as well as he should. Um, but a really classy winger um, for this level of league uh, could cause all sorts of problems. He's light on his feet and, uh, you know, sort of determined to keep going. And um, he'll get goals and assists for me. Has to be one to watch based on his uh, pre-season form as well. And he'll go well at Strom's good, sir. Yeah, we did, in fact, do a player analysis on him in the Axel Kial interview. So if you do subscribe, go back on iTunes or, or Spotify, go to the uh, How to Run a Football Club from Top to Bottom episode with Axel Kial, the Audible Manager, uh, uh, for Steve's detailed analysis there of Yanis Akauniex. Next on your list, you've got Christopher Klesson. Now, he's a goalkeeper and one of the youngest players on your list. Yeah, I've got to admit, I don't know enough too much about him. I've not seen him in action too much. There's other people out there um who, who probably uh have a better knowledge of this uh goalkeeper than me but uh by all things he's uh, highly rated um great uh reflexes um sort of a great mentality i keep hearing this great mentality mentality he's got that he's he's 19 year old but he's, he acts like a sort of 25 year old you know um experienced head on young shoulders so um you know, it's unusual you get some uh, young goalkeeper's going to be the starter at such a big club. Uh, but, uh, you know, with the new manager there, obviously has a lot of faith in him. And I'm interested to see him in action. Um, it's uh, I do like a goalkeeper, as you know. And there's not enough good goalkeepers in, in Norway, sadly, in the last few years. So uh, let's hope he's good. He reminds me perhaps a little bit of Julian Feilund at um, Rosenborg, but probably better than him. But it sounds like he's really uh, got the physical and mentals uh, to succeed um, and, and a starting goalkeeper for Volerenga at 19 year old. Yeah, that is that is um, quite exciting. And you've got another 19 year old on your list, Odin Bjortuft, uh at odd. Yeah, I mean, I think this guy's going to have to get minutes either at centre back or D mid. Um, just simply, the rotation is going to have to happen in the squad, and they've got too many old players around that sort of region of the uh of the positions that he's going to get minutes um i know he played um a few games last year and he caught my eye i think he's uh, got a good skill set um to succeed i mean this is a bit of a wild card sort of pick really I, whether or not he's going to be anything special I'm not, I'm not convinced about that but look, he's going to get the game time to develop um i think he's got a good reading of the game mentally uh which you need for that sort of uh, position he obviously lacks a little bit of strength at that age but he's got the skills, he's got the mental attributes. Um, as I say, he reads the game really well, and that, that's a big positive. So um, a player that is going to be on the field a lot more that could uh, develop uh, the, the more he plays. Fantastic stuff. And then you've got a very English-sounding name there, Robert Taylor. Yeah, he's got an English dad, uh, but he's a fin fin Finnish international. He's got 10 caps for his country, I think. Now, he was at Tromso last year, and they obviously got relegated, but... Uh, I had something about Taylor I like. Um, I mean, he's a first thing I must say is an incredibly versatile player. Um, he can play literally every spot on the field apart from centre back and goalkeeper. Um, that's how good he's got. A uh, two footed guy. And he, look, I don't really know exactly where he's going to slot into this team in bit brand, but um, it could be, he could be anyway, right wing, centre mid, right back if needed. You know, he's, he's got something about him. He's, he's had a good pre season as well. Um, one of the better performers I keep uh, reading about. And um, I say 25 year old, my, you know, the oldest player on the list here, but uh, I just think he could really be surprisingly good. You know, people might be talking about other players at Brand that are more sort of uh, wholesale names, but uh, Taylor's coming, new signing um, from a relegated club. But I think he can add plenty to the team. He's uh, it's a great technical player, but just a great rounded individual who is so uh versatile and you can't underestimate that um you know when when in a season like this where injury suspensions are going to kick in he can you can slot him in anywhere on that field and he'll do a good job for you yeah that's um interesting to know and anton selectros is one who i've come across but i think he's played in sweden hasn't he yeah he was a is it, is it a core or somewhere like that he's uh, on loan from rostov anyway in russia and uh the contract runs out. Um, I don't know if they extended it, but I think it runs out sort of end of July or something like that. Maybe they've extended it now, but I'm interested to see him because I think he's a bit of a classy player, you know, for this level of, of league. Um, and he's going to fit into the uh, sort of central midfield option 
left hand side of central midfield. Um, and uh, I say we don't tend to get players like this too often coming from from Russia. Although Sarsborg do have a link there, they did have a Russian goalkeeper a couple of years ago, Vazutin, who did really well. So they have a history of, of, of bringing sort of unusual signings in that do well. And uh, look, he could dominate that midfield. If, if you bring a player in as, that's sort of played at higher levels before and dominated, the elite Serbian can be a piece of cake. So I think he's a dark horse to really catch the eye at, at Sarsport. Um, I mean, we know that club has a lot of potential if things go right. I mean, I was a bit negative maybe about them earlier, about what might go wrong. But if things go right, you've got someone like that coming in, they can um, just take them to a new level. Yeah, and he's only young. Uh, he's 24 years old. And like you say, yeah, he was uh, he was at AOK. 138 games for them, in fact. And uh, seven goals, 14 assists. And he's a yeah, not a bad player, in fact. So uh, I'm surprised he's locked up in uh, in Norway, if I'm honest. Uh, so it could be an interesting one. He tends to play from the left-hand side or can also play as a defensive midfielder. Uh, next on your list is Hugo Vettelsen at Starbeck. Yeah, I mean, I had to choose some of them from Starbeck. Um, they've got such a great youth academy there. Um, there were sort of two or three on my potential list. But Hugo Vettelsen, um, I think, uh, you know, with the likes of Bryn Hildson uh, moving on and a couple of others, he's going to get game time either in sort of central attacking midfield or, or out wide. Um, he's very versatile in that, in that regard. Um, sort of a lightweight player, pacey, skillful. Pretty much what you expect out of the Starbeck academy. They have so many guys like this. Um, you know, Bahinen, um, didn't even talk about him. He's going to be moving probably to France at Rams or uh, or Nîmes. Um, but they, they, these guys just come through the system really well. And Hugo Bettelson's um, no different, highly skilled, got the quality, got the ability. Would not be surprised if he even leaves before the end of the season or sort of winter. You know, this is the Starbeck conveyor belt where they produce these young kids. But he can have a big year with a couple of other lads sort of moving on. Um, you know, I expect to see him sort of creating and, and scoring a few goals as well. Yeah, now Mulder have really got quite a deep squad, haven't they? And you, you've got one of their younger players on, on your 10 to watch this season. Uh, who have you gone for at Mulder? Yeah, I mentioned him in the preview briefly. Marcus Holmgren Pedersen. Uh, he's coming from Tromso. Um, second guy actually transferred from Tromso that's on this list. Just shows you that squad really should never have gone down. Uh, but he's a young right back, uh, sort of midfielder, anywhere on that right hand side up to the wings he can play. Now, he was just going to come in as backup, really, I think, get some minutes behind Christopher Harold's side. But Harold's side's gone down injured the whole year, ACL injury, which leaves them rather weak in that position. There's not really too many other options apart from Pedersen. So he's going to have to get game, uh, plenty of game time, isn't he? Uh, so all eyes are going to be on him. But from all accounts, he's been performing really well in pre season. I mean, the good thing in pre season. Obviously, they split the minutes, so uh, he's been getting plenty of time on the field and uh, he's looked good, by all accounts. Talented young player. They wouldn't have signed him if he wasn't someone with uh, plenty of ability. But um, you know, he, he's, he's just a guy that's going to have to be thrown in the deep end, uh, the champions, and he's going to be starting at least half the games at right back. You know, um, So uh, a really good talent. That, and the good thing is, you know, sometimes these injuries um, can have a positive effect for someone else, can't they? So he can develop a lot quicker. He would only have probably started about three or four games if Harold Stide had stayed fit. Now he's looking, looking 15, 20 games starting. So let's throw him in the deep end and see what he's got. And I love that idea of throwing a young kid in there who's, who's got the ability and potentially shining, you know? Yeah, and it's an undisclosed fee, isn't it? So um, that'll be an interesting one. Like you say, Trump's a, what have happened to them in the end? I mean, yeah, I still can't believe they got went down, to be honest. But let's move on to um, Patrick Berg. Yeah, Patrick Berg at uh, Buda Glimt. Uh, I think he's an underrated player in their lineup. He um, he can sort of play midfield in the uh, sort of uh, the, uh, the defensive midfield or sort of a deep line playmaker role a little bit higher up. And um, he had an injury last year that put him out of action for about one or two months. I never quite felt he was he was quite the same until sort of later on in the season. So now he's had the you know that injuries out of the way, I think he can really deliver in that part of the field. Um, and uh, you know he's got a good long shot on him if he's allowed to go forward. He's almost like a box to box midfielder actually. Twenty two year old now, um, so that little bit more experience can help him. And you know they've lost, they've lost players, but knowing Buda Glimt, the the guys that can step up, and I think Patrick Berg. Is one of those uh, again good all-rounded player physically 
um, really good uh, and he's got the skill set to deliver and he's got a bit of canniness about him as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm expecting potentially a really breakthrough year from Patrick Berg. And the final man on your list to round off our 10 to watch this season in Norway is a Viking player. Adrian Nielsen Pereira at left back. Yeah, young, fast. I mean, you can pretty much play anywhere on that left-hand side up to a winger. So he's a, an attacking left back um, who's got a great physical uh, pace. He can track back very quickly. And I noticed him towards the back end of last year when he was getting more minutes on the field that he was uh, a massive threat going forward. Um, he'll overlay, overlap, sorry, um, on that left-hand side and, uh, and cause all sorts of issues. 20-year-old, young talent, really worth keeping an eye out for at, um, at Viking there. And um, you know, the great thing about Viking, um, uh, that they're going to, they always rotate the squad nicely. They will give minutes to talented youngsters. They're not just going to be left to rot on the bench or the reserves. And that's the important thing about when you're developing young talent. Give them enough game time, not too much, but enough to, to, to develop their game. Fantastic stuff as always, Steve. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're pretty much running out of time now. That, that wraps up the 10 to watch and that wraps up the season preview, the predictions. Uh, we've got it all really there, haven't we? So um, first games are up, coming up in the couple of, next couple of days. Don't forget, we'll be bringing you regular shows throughout the season, reviewing teams, teams to watch, players to watch, um, teams in focus, all kinds of stuff on this season of the Nordic Football Podcast. We've been doing it for a while now, haven't we, Steve? We're, 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 we're used to it now. So um, we're looking forward to getting into the swing of things, aren't we? Yeah, it's been another mammoth podcast, hasn't it? So thank you for anyone who has listened to this deep into it. Um, but uh, yeah, once again, thanks very much. And really looking forward to the season. Look out for a lot of content from uh, Nordic Football uh, Podcast uh, throughout the next few months. There's going to be a lot of football to talk about, Jonathan, and uh, we'll be here to, uh, to deliver some insightful stuff. Most definitely. So, yeah, thanks very much. You know where to catch us. We've told you our links on social media. Yeah, um, go and go and have a look into it. And if you haven't listened to the Swedish uh, season preview as well, you can still listen back to that. Um, you know, so the seasons are kicking off. Things are swinging gradually into gear. It will be without fans for a while, but it will be back and we will have some football to talk about. So uh, 2020 is going to be unique, unique seasons, that's for sure. Very crammed in, but uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, Thanks a lot for joining us. We'll leave it there for this season preview 2020 Elite Serian, and we'll catch you on the next episode. So for now, thanks very much and goodbye.